quality education that's right for a child opens a bright future. Without that quality education, a child is on a path of uncertainty and failure. This is the civil rights issue of our time, it's the economic issue of our times, it's the social justice issue of our time. Political leaders need to get off the mat and start advocating more meaningful reform so that there's rising student achievement so that dreams can come true. During the time that Florida uh, did these reforms, Kansas really didn't do much, if anything. We're spending over half of our budget on K-12 education, just throwing more money uh, at schools without any accountability and without uh, good policy that has been proven to be successful in other states isn't gonna get the job done. Reform has to take place in, in Kansas if we're going to produce productive students that are able to carry the state and get it where it is supposed to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years and beyond. We've seen all the data, we did all the studies. Now we need somebody to be courageous. What are you doing if you're not reforming the things to assure that the next generation has a fighting chance in this incredibly challenging and competitive world that we're moving towards? So in 1998, I ran for governor saying that we needed to change our public education system. And I laid out a plan to do so. In 1999, um, I got a chance to work with the Florida legislature to implement probably the most meaningful suite of reforms uh, up till then that the, that the country had seen. We graded schools A through F. We gave school recognition dollars out for schools that showed improvement. We gave vouchers out for schools that were failing. And the net effect of all this was a turbulent time, certainly, but we turned the system upside down. And it was based on, literally as a candidate, going to visit 250 schools in a way that uh, put a human context around this. Uh, I never forget uh, going to Seminole High School where a kid was preparing to take the high school graduation test and it required an eighth grade level aptitude. And he couldn't answer a question I'm looking over his shoulders, which was a baseball game started at three and ended at 4.30, how long was the game? If you have enough of those examples of just uh, imagining what his world would look like going forward where we had these incredibly low expectation, no consequence between excellence and failure, no consequence between mediocrity and improvement, and it just kind of fueled me to be bigger and bolder, uh, and the legislature went along with it, which I'm very grateful for. And that started us on a journey of perpetual reform in the state of Florida. It was clear to me that the future for children as adults uh, would be dramatically better if we assured that they had a chance to learn, to learn how to read and to be able to acquire knowledge. Today, it is even a bigger deal. The net effect of this was we have rising student achievement in Florida that is the envy of many places in the country. The NAEP test, which is the nation's report card in 1998, Florida on the fourth grade reading test was 29th out of 31. There were two states worse. Uh, people could basically whisper, thank God for Florida because we were so, so poor. 10 years later, after ending social promotion in third grade, the largest uh, voucher program in the country, expanding charters, creating a, a, a focus on early childhood literacy, all of the combined efforts of the suite of reforms allowed us on 10 years later in 2007 to have a NAEP test where we were sixth out of 50 states. Florida's low-income kids are in the top two or three, Hispanic kids similarly, and African-American kids. And so when you, have these kind of, when you have this kind of success, it starts to sound like you're whining when you're opposed to this stuff, because it looks like you're for the economic interests of the adults rather than rising student achievement for children. The idea was to make, create accountability in a totally transparent way. And in education, there's, there's one real simple way of doing it, which is great schools based on student learning 
A, B, C, D, and F. And do it in an intellectually solid way, if you will. Don't do it um, simply based on proficiency, but reward improvement, learning gains. So the accountability was one of the things that came into being because the people were questioning our motivation. What they found out is that because we were about educating the children first, then accountability was more important to us because we had to demonstrate that we were focusing on the children, not dismantling the system. So once we set up an accountability process, it forced them into being accountable to themselves. Um, it was accountability for teachers to make sure that their children performed. Uh, it's grading of schools because parents didn't necessarily know that their children were going to schools, that um, the majority of those children were not graduating or moving to the next grade fully prepared. And we all know by the time you get to the third grade, if you haven't learned to read, oftentimes you just get moved along and you never learn to read. We had children graduating from high school and taking our entry level exams into our, what was then the community college system, now became our state, our state college system, and they couldn't pass it. But they had a Florida high school diploma that said that they were fully qualified and ready to go to community college. We had to make a change, and it was the future of our children. I have two boys. One of them, he's fine in a public school setting and he's able to work very well, do his work and, and you know, he doesn't have any major issues, he's happy. And then I have another child that needs extra support, uh, that will need extra resources that the school cannot provide. In my child's case, he has a sensory processing disorder and I've, I've experienced how teachers get frustrated with him and then just, instead of making it an issue about what his condition is or his ability to learn in a certain environment, uh, they make it into a discipline issue. So we need to make sure that we, each child, every child has an opportunity to compete in a global marketplace because that's our reality. That wasn't our reality 20 years ago. Let's say for example, my school were not here and the neighborhood schools that we have are failing schools. They are D's and F's for years. Did these students have a choice? These parents do not have, even if we open up choices and say, all righty, these students can go into other magnet schools, can apply at other places. Do the parents have the means to take them? They're hardly making ends meet. So these students are destined to go into those zone schools based upon the neighborhood zip code. Now, middle school is also an underperforming school. And then moving from underperforming school, middle school to high school, they're all failing. Where are these children going? Most of these students are not going to graduate. But with this choice, this little school, Women Academy, it opened up in this area. Now, 300 plus students have the opportunity to attend the school. It makes a big difference. Now these students are passing out of an A school. Middle school magnet applications go out and these school students are selected into programs that they never thought even existed. So they have more choices. They have more options and most of these students have gone into magnet schools and are doing extremely well. We keep up with it. They already are on their college path. Charter schools have to perform in order to survive. Charter schools have to show the results in order to stay in the business. We have to get student enrollment. We have to, for our finances, for student enrollment, we have to have the buy-in from the parents. We have to show results to the parents and only then they'll enroll. Public schools, not the same thing. So with charter schools, public schools get a push. It does extend to the individual student, then it extends to the individual school, then it extends to all of the other schools, and then all of the other students began to say, wow, what's going on over there? If I can go down the street and get this kind of return, if I don't want everybody to go down the street, I better figure out how to give equal return where I am. Now, if districts are losing students to the charter schools, what is their only option to get those students back? Compete, right? To get 
to par with the charter school results. And here, alternative choices are given to the students, more alternative choices, and more students benefit out of it. We are just competing to keep our students here, but students are benefiting. They have so many other choices which fit their needs. It's important to fund the reforms. Normally what you do is to say, okay, you got the base funding and then any new idea is on top of that and that's vulnerable to cuts if there's a downturn. We funded the reforms first. We rewarded the schools that showed um, progress with the bottom 25% of their student body. We provided uh, for every, every kid that passed an AP class, that was an additional bonus for the school grade. We bonus teachers who teach courses that uh, where kids pass AP and IB in these nationally recognized Cert certification program. So our, our accountability system is aligned towards more of what we want, which is rising student achievement. And we fund it. The largest bonus program for teachers in the United States is the school recognition dollars that, that exist in our, in our accountability system. Every school that is an A or shows improvement gets $100 per student directly to the, to the uh, wire transfer directly into the school. No cuts by the bureaucracy. And there are celebrations when schools have this kind of success. Uh, and 90% of that goes in the form of bonuses to teachers. We don't spend more per student than any place in the country. We're below average. But now the largest voucher program in the country is uh, the program for four-year-olds that get to spend with tax dollars a half day. And we created reading coaches in every elementary school to teach teachers how to teach reading. We ended social promotion in third grade. We created a gate because in fourth grade you're learning, you're reading to learn, and, and prior to that you have to read to be able to do math and science. If you leave fourth grade behind in reading, you have a 12% chance of ever catching up. So we can't afford as educators to allow children to move through kindergarten through third grade and go into fourth grade behind in reading. Because when we do that, we doom them to a really difficult life, to challenges in trying to secure employment and provide for their families. So about 20 years ago, Florida passed a law that required every student before they go on to fourth grade to demonstrate a level of mastery in foundational reading skills. But at the same time that the policy changed, there was a huge investment um, by the state and by the feds in helping our teachers understand those practices and how to put them into action in their classrooms and as a school. And I think the policy coupled with that investment in relearning was so important. The change in policy challenged our beliefs and assumptions. If we just pass kids along or hope they get better over time, they don't. Question. Let me ask you, would you rather send your children to a school that has more resources and poor quality education or would you send your children to a school that does not have the best physical resources but has the best quality education that is going to prepare your child for life, a lifelong learner? Where would you rather do? The schools that are in the underprivileged neighborhoods, the zip code schools, they, they do have more funding. I would love to have those resources. but. History tells us those resources have not made much of a difference. If it would have, if funding would have made a big difference in the schools that are in these neighborhoods, then we would have seen different results. Have we seen different results? No, we have not. Maybe just a little bit. But if you give them choices, so about whether that school is the right fit for the child. Yes, funding is important. I want more funding, but Choices are more important. Accountability is more important.
when we look at, at educational reform, educational options, we look at outcomes, Florida has made a difference while Kansas were staying the same. Kansas really didn't do much, if anything, in terms of embracing any of those reforms. And as a result, our student performance results have uh, been fairly flat or stagnant. Not to say that all Kansas kids are failing. There are a lot of kids that are doing great. But what about the children uh, who don't have that opportunity? If, if a child is going to a, a failing school, and let's say uh, they've got nine months at that school, and every day they're going there, and they're getting the same thing every day. Uh, by the end of that nine months, I don't believe that that child is going to be any better. And I believe that's where a lot of children are when they stay in a failing school for a whole year. At the end of that school year, they're probably not educationally alive. So if a child is not reading by third grade, reading proficiently by third grade, they begin to fail in other areas. Reading, most important thing, uh, you have to learn how to read to do anything. It cripples a child for the rest of their life for them to not be reading by third grade. Social promotion was a big deal from the, that was one of the reasons I got in, because they graduate high, students from high school without being able to read and write at grade level. Obviously the best answer is we need to be able to change what we're doing so that they're not held back and they're on grade level at the very beginning. We need to solve the problem before it ever becomes a problem. Supposedly, the, the diplomas that uh, students are getting out of high school uh, is, is a statement to that student and their parents that your son or daughter is college or career ready. Uh, and yet we know that that's not true. We know that from talking to the regents who, who have to uh, uh, provide remedial coursework before they can even start their um, baccalaureate track. We know that from talking to employers who say they just want somebody who will show up on time and can read a instruction manual and, and do some basic things. From time to time, I've had trouble finding people to be employed. One of the pharmaceutical companies was trying to, to build a facility in McPherson. And they needed a few hundred employees they were bemoaning the fact that they couldn't find those employees. The state of Kansas needs approximately 20 to 22% of our jobs to have a bachelor's, master's, or PhD. 20, 22%. The rest need some kind of training. If the people don't get involved, if the CEOs don't get involved, the, the uh, personnel directors and absolutely say, we must have not only bachelor's, master's, PhDs, but also the certificates. And they need to have that within 18 months after high school, 12 to 18 months after high school. If they aren't pushing on that hard, I think they're derelict because that needs to happen. There is, and the only way for that to happen is for a student to be focused on what they want to do while they're still in high school to spend over $14,000 per student and to see the gap between spending and the results that we're getting wide and spending going up, scores remaining the same. Uh, I, I believe that there, there's a problem when someone is asking for more money and you're getting the same results. Just throwing more money uh, at schools without any accountability and without uh, good policy that has been proven to be successful in other states isn't gonna get the job done. We're spending over half of our budget on K-12 education, and yet we're not getting much in the way of uh, results. Kansas as a state, I think, has done a good job of funding. The problem with, uh, with, with what's going on in Kansas is the allocation of those resources. The schools have not been putting the money where it really needs to be placed, and that is in instruction. Barely half of every dollar uh, that the state and the legislature sends to the schools gets spent on instruction, and the results uh, and student performance outcomes show that. The schools go to court to get more and more funding without any accountability and with fighting every reform that goes along with that funding. A Supreme Court in Kansas in 2005 broke with precedent and decided that they had a role to play in determining how much money should be spent on schools. Ultimately, the legislature did uh, appropriate the funds that the court wanted, but we put some policies in place. And, and one of those policies 
was that we need to target the money where the money is really needed. And that those are the kids that are, that are not proficient, that are at risk. We were concerned that not enough money for instruction was being uh, utilized by the schools. So we had a state policy put in place. 65% of funds should go for instruction. At the time, there was only about 55% going in. Since that time, we've never gotten to 65%. The cumulative effect over the last approximately 15 years of not getting to 65% and having that actual percent go from 55 to around 51 is a loss of about $8.6 billion to the classroom. That's money that the legislature appropriated. That's money that the school spent, but they spent it on something other than instruction. That is heartbreaking and unforgivable in my estimation. Does anybody think that schools spending billions and billions of dollars and, and only putting about 50 cents on the dollar into instruction is a good idea? The biggest impediment to reform in Kansas has been a combination of factors, not the least of which is a mentality by the public school system of a monopoly. It, it's, they, they think every kid is theirs and every kid should be in their classrooms. And we're expecting four or 500 students to fit into this, this system that has been created. When you got four or 500 different personalities, you got four or 500 different ways that, that children learn, but the current system is they must all fit into this. No matter what their learning style is, no matter where they are in their educational journey, that somehow they believe that every child fits into this same box. And I believe that's what's caused a lot of problems in the public school system. That's what's caused a lot of absenteeism. That's what's causing parents to not be happy with it. And it's causing parents now to really begin to seek out different ways of educating their children. The education community, for the most part, when they hear the word school choice, they're, they're against it. And yet we do have school choice in Kansas. We have school choice for those who can afford it. The kids that really need it, it's the kids who are identified as at risk, generally speaking, are lower socioeconomic. Their parents do not have the wherewithal and the means to move their child to another learning environment. And that's discrimination. And it's really sad because their schools also are challenged uh, to get these kids uh, to proficiency. They're the very ones that ought to have the opportunity as students in Florida have uh, had the opportunity to move to either a, a, a successful public school or, or a private school. There are some real sacrifices being made by parents who really want their children to have a great education and have a great future. They're working, they have jobs, maybe not as good jobs as they'd like, but out of that job, they're, they're paying taxes. When they spend money, they're paying taxes. Part of that money is going toward education. And for them to have to pay twice, I believe it's, it's very unfair because they chose a different path for their child when the money is already there for their child. And the answer is, is that the money follows the child. If the money is already there, it should go where the child, where the parents say that the child is going for their educational journey. The people need to be involved, parents, grandparents, and at some level, business owners do. If they will get the attention of, particularly the governor, but leadership in the legislature and say, we cannot find employees to be able to do the job that needs to be done. Consequently, we're going to move our facilities to North Carolina or South Carolina or somewhere. We're going to move them somewhere. If that doesn't get the attention of the powers that be, I don't know what would. Well, first we've got to understand you're not competing with the student in the desk next to you. We live in a global economy. There's children in other countries and you're competing with that child uh, for a, a job, an opportunity, a scholarship. Now that child in Florida, they have better educational options than that child in Kansas. 
they have a better chance of succeeding. They have a better chance of getting into that university, getting that scholarship. Kansas is, is holding uh, it, it's, its students up, it's holding up its workforce, it's holding up it, its, its college institutions, it's holding up its athletic programs, it's holding up a lot of things by not doing educational reform. You know, we have children that come out of the public school and unfortunately uh, they come out of failing schools. And for them to be at Urban Prep and to have an opportunity to, to get a great education, even have a brand new beginning, uh, it, it brings a lot of happiness to the family. Kids are excited about coming to school and most of all, they're excited about learning. One of the things that, that keep us going is as just like this morning, we came and we opened the doors and there were families outside. There were children getting out of cars, children getting out of vans, and they came in with smiles on their faces. And some of them came in a little tired, a little down. And you have those conversations with them. And then we get the morning motivation and kids are ready. And they say, let's do this. I'm ready to do this. Uh, that, that gives you hope. Uh, that gives you strength that you know what i'm going back and i'm gonna fight again for these children i teach because there's so many students who are in need who really inspire me um, who work really hard and i love to see when students catch on to something and have that light bulb moment there are a lot of great teachers uh administrators uh people and in, in, in the public school system that I believe they sincerely care about children and, and they want children to succeed. I believe that in them, they know that something is wrong here. And today you see superintendents of these large school districts that are proud of the fact that Florida is leading the way in terms of rising student achievement. They're embracing it. Most teachers embrace it. Uh, there's been a change in mindset that is pretty dramatic. The families that I've seen that have taken advantage of those opportunities um, to choose where their child can be ed educated um, have been so grateful for that and um, have been so proud of the successes that they've seen in their students. Um, so I think it's incredibly important to have those options. And so it's just common sense to me to align everybody's interest towards more, more of what we want, which is rising student achievement. And uh, there should be financial rewards for the teachers that do extraordinary work. Every school that is an A or shows improvement gets $100 per student. And 90% of that goes in the form of bonuses to teachers. Now the NEA and their, their state affiliates don't, don't always like that. They like to collectively bargain all this. Um, they want the power on top of their teachers. But teachers appreciate the fact that they're being rewarded for a job well done. The largest tax credit uh, scholarship program, which was implemented in my second year, now has, I think, 120,000 low-income kids. Those families um, now march on Tallahassee, if you will, and make sure that the legislators that represent them, predominantly African-American Democrat representatives, uh, know that it's, this is a very important program. So uh, over time, there is now uh, the garnering of support in the places which you really want. You want to create a constituency of reform amongst mom and dads. Parents should have a say about where their taxpayer dollars go. My belief is that money should go with the child. So over time, um, we, we did have one news, statewide newspaper, uh, large newspaper, be supportive in Jacksonville, but generally people were opposed to this to begin with in the press. The teachers union was opposed to it. The school boards were opposed to it. Um, the, the blob, if you will, was opposed to it. You had opposition from the teachers union. You had opposition from time to time from parents. It was amazing. I can't tell you the number of letters we got written by school children. It was obvious they wrote them in class. And the worst part of it was I wanted to correct their grammar and their spelling and write back to their teacher and say, is this what you're teaching? The issue of education is um, very political because in, in many school districts, many cities, many towns particularly, the school districts are the largest employers. 
And so the focus inevitably gets to the economic interests of the adults. We had dramatic reform, and the adults had done pretty good. The idea that somehow you're, you're going to destroy public education by embracing choice or accountability has just not been proven in Florida. The more competition we had in education, the better off we became. Uh, so I, for one, believes, believe that competition is good in this. But you will hear those who say, oh no, you're making the public schools compete with, with others. Well, those children are going to have to go out and compete with others in the workaday world. So I, I think you need to reframe the conversation to say the objective of public education is to assure that children get a year's worth of knowledge in a year's time and do that successively over the K-12 experience rather than focusing on the retiree benefits of people who, um, who are, are doing quite well in the system and they're, they're still going to do fine. But we had success. That was the key. The key was to implement these ideas faithfully and have rising student achievement. The bigger the idea, the more you have to build um, a coalition uh, of like-kind people that might be different in every other aspect. And we did that. Uh, we didn't have huge support amongst Democrats, but we had enough support to, uh, to validate the idea. Uh, we had support from the business community. We had support amongst good teachers, great teachers, that weren't threatened by accountability. In fact, they embraced it and wanted to see it. Uh, we had support among parents that wanted more choices, particularly lower income parents that are assigned schools in basically all across this country. And so we built a coalition that was helpful. But I'll be honest with you, if you don't have a political leader willing to take the political risk uh, to, to, to advocate big things and then to implement it in an uh, intellectually honest way, a faithful way to the ideas that, uh, that can yield a good result, you're not going to get um, the benefits of reform. You have to be all in. Uh, success you know, in, in these things is never final. Reform's never complete. You have to constantly be pushing forward. And we've had good governors that have continued these reforms working with really reform-minded legislators. Now there's a constituency for these reforms that'll make it hard for it to turn back. We all have the same goal in mind. We want our Kansas kids to be educated. We want them to have opportunities. We want them to feel good about staying in the state. We want them to feel like that they've had a good education. If we could get rid of uh, this litigation environment and this adversarial type of environment, I think we could come together and, and, and really make some good reforms that are gonna help everybody. You can, you can find common ground with the institutional forces that resist reform. But the other thing that's important is if you're elected to an office, a state house or state senator or governor or any position of responsibility, what are you doing if you're not reforming the things to assure that the next generation has a fighting chance in this incredibly uh, challenging and competitive world that we're moving towards? If you're not there to serve people and to change the things that are broken, what are you there for? Imagine what the world looks like a decade from now, 12 years from now, when a kindergartner is graduating from a school in Kansas uh, that is capable of either getting a, getting a job that they're career ready or already having under their belt uh, college level work that makes it possible for them to graduate on time for a four year degree. Their dreams are gonna be broad and big. Uh, they're not going to be broad and big if we dumb everything down and have what my brother called the soft bigotry of low expectations. I really am optimistic, but, but we can't let too much time pass or we're gonna lose more and more of our graduates. The money that we spend on a child, more important than the money we spend on reforming that child in prison. I think this is the civil rights issue of our time, it's the economic issue of our times, it's the social justice issue of our time. Political leaders who have the obligation to reform the systems that are so important for the future of their constituencies need to get off the mat and start advocating more meaningful reforms so that there's rising student achievement so that dreams can come true.